Good morning, everyone. I'm Dominique Wright from the Department of Agriculture and Food Western Australia, and with me today I have Dusty Severson from the department, who's our entomologist um, and is a specialist on Russian wheat aphid. And today we're going to be discussing uh, Russian wheat aphid and how we're going to recognise or identify it out in the field given the recent outbreak of Russian wheat aphid in South Australia and now in Victoria. So I'm going to hand over to Dusty. Good day, everybody. So there's a few questions we're going to address today. Um, as many of you heard, with the recent introduction of Russian wheat aphid into South Australia and now into um, Victoria, um, we're obviously wondering whether we have it here in WA or not. A couple of reasons why we're treating this very differently um, is firstly, it has to be managed very differently than the two common um, cereal aphids that we have, which are the oat and corn aphids. And so we have a situation where not only firstly does the aphid inject toxins into the plant, which causes um, more stress. That's the first um, uh, thing that's different than the aphids we already have. But secondly, it causes leaf curling. And so when this leaf curling happens as the leaves are trying to unfold and um, so basically it means that insecticides are much less effective and so where this occurs overseas the main method of managing this pest is through um, breeding resistant varieties so we have a couple of, of scenarios so we're hoping we don't have it in WA but in terms of the field um, surveillance there's a few questions that we'll address just here um, what is the aphid? How does it affect crops? Um, what should we be looking for? How should we report? And then a bit on, you know, trying not to um, transfer this pest between paddocks and properties and where we can get more information. So here's one picture of the symptoms caused by the Russian meat aphid. And you can see some nymphs there. Um, firstly, you can see that it's quite a slender aphid and it's a little bit smaller than the oat and corn aphid as well but the the, the symptom on this um, plant this picture came out of um, from Michael Nash in South Australia you can see the symptoms actually look, look a lot like um, wheat street mosaic virus <clears throat> so symptoms are one thing that we can use as an indicator um, but I think where we have early infestations these symptoms will be will be less pronounced but certainly we, 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 can, we can use these when we um, look through fields. So as with the other cereal aphids that we have, um, they only infest um, cereal crops and grasses. Um, so we don't have to worry about the rest. I mentioned about the initial detections and that um, they inject toxins. So here's a bit of a closer look at the aphid. Uh, those of you that do know what the oat and corn aphids look like, which I'll pull up some pictures in a minute, you'll see how quite different it is. Firstly, you'll notice the, the lack of exhaust pipes or cornicles up, up the top of the backside, um, and that's quite pointy at the end of the back. So this is the oat aphid. You can see we've got some, some winged in there, winged aphids, which are much harder to identify, so generally we just go straight for the for the wingless version. And the oat aphid has very distinctive rusty patch at the top of the backside and those those cornicles or, or sorry, cells, which um, are just the sort of exhaust pipes. Um, so those are those are a good giveaway. And of course, in terms of the, the other um, common cereal aphid, the corn aphid, you can see it's quite different, but you can also see those those um, exhaust pipes on the top of the backside. Um, that picture on the right, I mean, you can see that there's a lot of aphids there, but really without a hand lens, you're not going to be able to see um, those features that I've just described. So it's really important to get in um, with a hand lens. Um, a lot of smartphone uh, cameras are really good these days, um, and often you can even zoom in on those. 
um, or if you even have a macro lens attachment to your smartphone, those are really good. Um, I think more and more people are using those these days. So just in terms of relating to the most common ones we have, the, the, in terms of the aphid itself, the most distinctive features are really the lack of those exhaust pipes on the top of the backside and the shape. So yeah, they're, they're a little bit pear-shaped, the ones we already have, whereas the, the Russian meat aphid is much more slender and um, sort of tapered. So that's good. We have that to go with. Um, there's a lot of pests um, that we still don't have in Australia, and if we did, um, some of them are so hard to identify. Um, so at least we have um, some really good characteristics to work with here. And I mentioned about the symptoms. So hopefully, um, certainly in South Australia, they picked up symptoms pretty quickly. Um, so I mentioned about the exhaust pipes, and some can be winged and some can be wingless. Um, in terms of the winged ones, I mentioned they're much harder to identify, so really hone in on the um, the, the wingless uh, version there. And in terms of the leaf curling, this photo here, you can see the leaf has been un, unfurled or un, uncurled. There's quite a lot in there. You see the streaking, but those streaks aren't always yellow. They can go to reddish purple um, as well. So some of these symptoms can be confused with, with virus symptoms as well. So it's important to, um, you know, really get in there and uncurl some of these leaves and have a look. So where and what to look for in terms of actually looking in a paddock. Generally with aphids, they're, they're fairly poor flyers and they're m more often um, moved around on wind, although they can move a little bit when there's not much wind. So we often see these strong edge effects um, in crops, at least when, when crops are initially being um, colonized. So at least we have that to go with where we can focus on crop perimeters and especially where there's been a green bridge, uh, anywhere along roadsides near cereal paddocks and that sort of thing. Uh, just to have a look at, um, I know ryegrass is one of the highlighted hosts, but there's many other grasses. And of course, look at the look at the um, the cereal crop as well. But certainly at the edge and anywhere you see stressed plants, aphids prefer stressed plants. Um, that could be any number of things from nutrient deficiency to to drought stress. So that's a, a good good thing to hone in on. And you can see in this picture, there's quite a lot of leaf curling um, going on here. The, the, the vertical curling. Sometimes it curls the other way as well. And it's really stunting the, the plants there. And here we have that sort of edge effect, patchy damage occurring. These are overseas um, photos. And yeah, you can see some plants, they've obviously been, been killed. This is a, must have been an early infestation. And then um, they're really stressing the, the plants where the aphids occurring. <clears throat> and where, where the head wants to emerge, um, often those those ons get trapped, um, which is sometimes a symptom of something else as well. So it's a good idea to have a have a good look at that. So on to how to report this. Um, it's a bit different than the usual reporting into pest facts, where you know these are all things that we already have. Um, this is something that's uh, you know a little bit more sensitive, just in the in, in the sense that we don't want to be transferring it around. Um, the grain belt, so firstly, in terms of, um, you know, maybe firstly not sending samples if you find suspect um, plants. So we would, we would prefer to firstly um, use the reporting apps that we have. The reason for that is um, we want photos, so we want uh, crops that have been inspected that are suspect, but also ones that, you know, are, are, are clean of aphids. So we can get a snapshot of what's going on out there. Um, and also because the apps, whether you're in mobile range or not, they record your location. So we can automatically get a snapshot um, of what's going on there. And so we, here at the department, we have our, all our crop protection researchers that normally do their surveillance in all their research areas already. They're um, already looking into these apps and they'll be using these for 
all their own um, inspections and that sort of thing. So that's our first um, uh, way of reporting. Also, importantly, is the exotic plant pest hotline, which automatically goes to our pest and disease information service. Um, so anybody can call that number, which is 1-800-084-881. Um, and there's always um, people on the other end of the line to talk to. So I mentioned about avoiding sending samples, but um, sorry, where, where samples do need to be sent, it's important to uh, take measures to stop preventing or sorry, to stop spread of this of this aphid in case it is. So there's you know double bagging and and um, certainly contact us first. Uh, and in terms of preventing spread between paddocks, you can go on to the farmbiosecurity.com.au website for lots of um, different options of, you know, farm biosecurity measures to, to prevent spread and all that. But I think people generally know, um, especially those that know about aphids, they love to, to um, stick to clothing. Not so much boots, but certainly they, they could, but they really do like to stick to clothing and um, transfer that way. So there's a number of options there, especially um, brushing down your clothes at least, um, at the very least anyway. There's a lot of information which has been updated pretty quickly here over the last couple of weeks um, on DAFA's website. There's uh, oodles of information here if you want to go on to um, the website, anything from like what to look for, um, yeah, all the way through to, um, you can see the list there. So um, hopefully I've covered everything there. Um, okay, thank you, Dusty. So uh, we have one question from Jeff Tom Thomas, Dusty, which is, is it host specific to cereals and grasses and therefore does it not colonize broadleaf plants? Do we need to look at these or not look at the broadleaf plants? Yeah, that's right. Don't look, we don't need to look at the broadleaf plants at all. How fast do they spread from Trent Butcher? Yep, so in terms of the um, life cycle of, of the aphid, it's the same as the oat and corn aphid that we have. So they don't reproduce sexually. They do only reproduce asexually and produce live young, which are all females. So what happens is the winged female, which only, only requires one, colonizes a plant and then starts producing um, generally wingless nymphs. So as long as the plant condition is, is good, generally what happens is that spread is, is reduced significantly. And aphids are triggered to produce winged aphids when um, the host plant condition deteriorates from stress or natural senescence and all that sort of stuff. So generally we have the same situation with other aphids where when they colonize, um, when the conditions are right, the spread is really significantly reduced. So we'll see these sharp edge effects where they're kind of restricted to edges. Where we get situations where we, you know, the rain shuts off and we start getting some um, pretty heavy stress then we see that those aphids moving much more rapidly. So it's it's kind of, it really depends on on the weather and it depends on um, yeah this this the season. Um, heavy heavy rainfall events are good at knocking them out generally as well, and that that reduces spread to some extent. Another question from Jeff Thomas: Can we get a mix of aphid species in a crop or even on a plant, or do they exclude each other? Yeah, That's a really good question. Yeah, generally m most often. Um, we see either corn or oat aphids, but I've seen a mix. So I think I think we'll, it's very possible we'll see a mix. Yeah, for sure. So if we're going to see a mix of aphids, do we need to concentrate on the symptoms that we're seeing to suspect that we might have Russian wheat aphid dusty, or do we need to, um, if they see the aphids, then we need to get them to take photos and send them in so we can start excluding things like that. Yeah, so it's both. If you see symptoms, definitely take a photo of that as well. But if, if you don't, yeah, definitely we have to identify those aphids. So all of you, can you please take photos of aphids while you're out doing your crop inspections on a day-to-day -day basis? 
It would be wonderful. Um, to see what other questions are coming in. Oh, they're coming in thick and fast. We have a question from Andrew Blake. So Andrew's asking us um, about the effectiveness of insecticides or anti-feed mm -hmm. insecticides. <clears throat> At this stage, we really don't know. Like we have, we have um, a list of chemicals that are registered for the cereal aphids that we have, and on, generally on labels, often it just says cereal aphids. Um, so there's been a permit been put in place by Plant Health mm -hmm. Australia, a national permit through the APVMA. Um, so that was for chlorpyrifos and perimicarb. Chlorpyrifos has generally been the most consistently used um, in other countries. And that, that's, like I said, that's a national permit. When it comes to the other chemicals, um, you know, the SPs are registered to prevent virus transmission and generally, um, or as, as anti-feeds, as you say, whether they work at, at killing aphids, um, generally we, we've, we've said, you know, not the best. But so in terms of how effective they are in Russian wheat aphid, I think the, the short answer is we don't know. And even in terms of the, the, the newer um, sulfoxiflora, I haven't been able to find any information on that, I mean that's that's registered for cereal aphids, um, but yeah, that that I think that scene will be covered a little bit um, more in depth, and we're certainly watching closely what happens um, over east in this space. But um, there's, there's there's preparations put in place for sure. Um, however, I believe we don't want people just going out spraying willy nilly at the moment unless they really need to. Um, and that's why we would rather people monitor and take photos of the aphids and, and especially while at the moment we, there's no evidence that we have Russian wheat aphid here. So Yeah, this, this is why it's a bit, it's a, it's a very different situation. Um, so, you know, we want to get a handle on it if it is here first. So there's, um, our biosecurity team have a number of measures in place, um, you know, if and when. Um, it's detected, so that's why it's a very different situation. So there, you know, there there would be a series of surveillance activities um, and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, it's, it, it's it's not a case of just throw everything at it if you suspect it's Russian meat aphid. It, it's it's different in the in the sense that um, we really need to identify it first. Yep. Definitely give us a call. We don't know if we can access it too, so maybe say that. Oh yeah. No worries. Yeah, there's another um, issue with availability of, of, of chemical as well, which is kind of being addressed. So yep. that's another thing to watch this space for, I guess, whether we have um, the chemical available in the state, you know, if and when we have it. So Yeah, so don't panic yet. Um, we have another question, which is, what about hosts over summer, um, the dairy or summer grasses? Yep, definitely. Um, I mean, that's that's the thing. Summer summer pastures and things like that is something we're, we're going to have to look into for sure. Like we have a much different climate than other countries that have this aphid. They do live and grow crops with this aphid, so they manage it. Um, but it's a different situation for us. Um, we have a good um, summer break that we use to our advantage. It generally kills off most things, which is good. Um, but where there's where there's green bridge, as with other aphids, um, it's going to be much more of an issue where we have a higher green bridge for sure. Um, Andrea has asked us if these aphids have similar temperature tolerances as our other aphids, or are they different? Generally, most aphids have a certain range of optimal conditions, but they will, in terms of surviving, they can survive quite hot and quite cold conditions as well. So it's um, optimal conditions for most aphids are around sort of 23 to 27 in terms for reproduction and, and all that, where the temperatures become less favorable, they reproduce less and um, and all that sort of thing. But yeah, they can, they can survive for sure. Um, as long as there's a host, that's that's the main thing. So, in very, even in hot conditions, these hosts form. They they give the aphid a microclimate. Um, 
so you know it's the temperature is even lower in, in that area yeah. so. and from Mike Davies we're being asked um, are we hoping to gather photos of all aphids found in cereal crops so the answer to that is yes yeah that'd be great yep for sure so it's start sending your photos in yep um, and Alison Lacey has asked us is uh, do they like to hide right down in the crown area of the plants? Is this right? So it would make it difficult? Yeah, where they can where they can um, form pretty heavy leaf curling, they form their own little microclimate. So they don't need to move far from there. But yeah, where they colonize a plant, I think it's important when you're inspecting tillers to really open them up um, and have a look down. Because this aphid is flatter as well than the other aphids we have, which makes it much more capable of hiding within those leaf um, whirls and, and, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. Um, Andrew Blake has asked us about our, if our current cereal varieties have much resistance to this aphid. I'm pretty sure we don't have any in the current varieties that we are using, um, but there was um, a big GRDC project conducted at Murdoch University recently um, where some resistant germplasm was put in varieties and whatnot, but I don't know a lot about that. And um, that's certainly something that they'd be looking at over east at the moment for sure. So I don't know, don't know how that's going on the scene at the moment. Okay. Um, and we've just been reminded through Rob Emery, thank you, Rob, to also take photos of healthy plants to prove absence. So while while you are out scouting and doing your normal day-to-day -day work, if you can take photos of healthy plants or plants with aphids, anything that gives us all the data that we need. And Luke has asked us if symptoms are already seen in the scene, is the damage already done to the plant? Um, or if we use insecticides, do the do the symptoms subside or do the plants grow out of the symptoms if they've been infected early? Mm -hmm. I think it depends. There's obviously a threshold of when the plant goes over to a state of, um, say, tiller abortion, for example. Um, so the short answer is I, I really don't know in terms of the phenology of the plant, but um, it's really it's a numbers game with, with Russian meat aphid as it is with other aphids where there are enough there that um, damage is going to be sustained. So you get yeah, tiller abortion um, and um, yeah, I mean, you, and later on probably um, issues, well, issues with the, the head emerging and all that is going to cause some, some issues. Oh, because the heads get caught up yeah. and in the tillers? Yeah. I don't know whether that causes flower abortion or, or all that, but there's the sustained damage that happens. So I'm not 100% aware that threshold is. And this is another thing about we're in a Mediterranean climate. We don't really know how this is going to perform in our environment, even in um, the different latitudes we have in WA. So, um, yeah, we're, we're sort of comparing with, with other countries at the moment where, where it does occur. Okay. So Andrew's asking us if there are a serious vector of viruses. Well, Russian wheat aphid overseas is considered a minor vector of, of um, barley yellow dwarf virus, so um, that's that's a much lesser concern for us. Yeah. Um, Mark Seymour has asked us about has well saying that the recent weather has knocked back our um, other cereal aphids. So are the Russian aphids any tougher than these? Um, than our standard cereal ones. I would say that would be it'd be a similar situation. I don't I don't know 100%, but um, yeah, especially where um, you know rainfall events followed by some warm days, which might not happen at the moment as we head into colder weather. Um, but often they can get attacked by naturally occurring fungus as well and knock knock them back. Um, but yeah, we don't. We're not 100% on how, how that's going to mm -hmm. perform. Um, we've had a few questions about whether we need negative reports, so I'm just going to remind everyone yep. that we need both positive and negative reports, please, being sent in by those two phone apps that are available.
Wow, that's a really interesting question, Andrew. Andrew's asking us whether, um, in regards to the implication of asexual reproduction and genetic diversity within aphid populations, how quickly can they evolve resistance to insecticides or adapt to our climate? Yeah, well, in terms of this species, um, what, what I've read up on is um, there aren't very big issues with insecticide resistance in this species, but the main the main, uh, I guess, reason for spray failures is the fact that they hide so well and they cause that that leaf curling. So it's not really a, a, an issue of insecticide resistance that we know of, but it is a it's a contact issue for sure. Yep. I mean, we don't know how this is going to perform in spring as well. So when we have big sort of you know a lot of biomass and poor poor spray penetration, what's going to happen there? So we're Another okay. reason why we're looking closely to what's going on over east in this in this um, in this space. If I answer that question, yep, um, I think so. Yep. Um, so Jeff's asking us about our varieties. Do we know if it, the varieties vary in their um, susceptibility or in the infestation rates of the aphids? Will they differ according to the varieties? Have we seen anything like that yet? We don't know, but I, I really don't think there's going to be um, any difference. Um, yeah, serial aphid varieties, I think, have been screened um, in the past for, you know, is one variety more susceptible to the oater corn aphids that we already have, and there hasn't really been, um, yeah, m m much of a, a difference there. I think it's a case of actually purposefully putting putting in resistant um, genes into, into these varieties, yeah. Okay. And Doug's asked us, um, is it likely that these aphids will be found in people's gardens, on grass or other plants such as roses? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, we, we, we still don't know how, how this aphid um, came in in the first place, so if it's, yeah, whether it's hanging around in, in grasses on, on footy ovals as well, we don't know. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, the aphids that we do have do hang around in, in, in town sites and, and urban areas. So. Thomas is asking, how would it get here? Wind, human, trash, or seed? Um, it wouldn't be through seed, but um, any, any green material that's going to host it, certainly in, anything can move it. So, yeah, vehicles and, and people. Trent's asking us historically, how damaging has severe outbreaks been? And are there certain conditions that would cause this so-called storm? Yeah. So, firstly, it, um, it is a numbers game, and it's a dependent on on temperatures. So, over in the U.S., for example, um, where they have summer crops and they have warmer weather, the aphids can reproduce much more um, quicker and more exponentially. Can you go back to that question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but in terms of severe outbreaks, some cases that I've I've read about are over greater than 80 percent. Um, yield loss. So that's in a worst case um, situation and generally where the plants yeah, are being killed early on sort of seedling and tillering um, stages. Is there any alternative control strategies that can be used? Well the main one is, is the resistant variety um, I guess approach. That's generally what's going on and there's, there's lots and lots of research being done because certain biotypes of the aphid are also overcoming resistance in varieties, so they have to really stay on top of it, which is another issue. That's the end of the list of questions that we have. Um, so I would like to thank you all for attending our webinar this morning. It has been recorded and will be placed up on the DAFWA website next week, which we will let you know the links if you'd like to look at back at the photos and the symptoms. Um, and thank you again, everyone. Cheers.